Hi there from a locked down Sydney. Prior to becoming a teacher, an art teacher, and a maths teacher, and an engineering teacher, and everything else that I taught, technology, etc, etc, I was very, very interested in radio. And my original idea was to become an electrical engineer when I left high school. And those of you that are um, subscribed to this channel will know that I'm presently studying engineering. Now, I don't know whether I'm going to last five years, but I've just gotten through my first semester of year one. And you can watch the, the videos on this channel if you want to um, see how that's going for me. It's been, a, it's been an interesting ride for this uh, deranged and old brain. But uh, prior to that career as a teacher, I was very interested in radio as, as a younger person. And we had a good friend of the family who basically had an Aladdin's cave of radio gear in his basement. He was a ham radio operator. Now, for those of you that don't know what ham radio is, it's basically amateur radio, which is playing around with antennas, radios, etc., etc. You can still find it online. It's probably not as um, popular as it was um, in the past because um, talking to people overseas now is something that's done very easily on the internet. But Back in the day, if you wanted to speak to someone overseas and you wanted to do it by phone, it was very expensive. But if you were a ham radio operator, um, I could set up, I did have antennas set up in my backyard and from about the age of 13 onwards, I had a radio license and I could speak to people in America, the Japan, et cetera, et cetera, all the other ham operators on um, the high frequency radio um, gear that I had in my bedroom. Um, and it was a, a fantastic hobby and it got me very interested in radio. And as synchronicity would have it, after struggling with maths for years and managing to matriculate to a university, probably Wollongong Uni if I wanted to do engineering, I decided that I couldn't really face the, the, the mathematics for another four years of an engineering degree. So I, was, I, I went to the, um, the school um, careers advisor and he was the sort of guy that would basically say to kids when they said, you know, how hey, I want to be a, a doctor, ha ha ha, as if you're going to be a doctor without ATAR. So he was uh, not a very nice person a lot of the time, but I guess in some respects for some kids they would say, well, I'll show you. I was in his um, uh, career's office and he had all the pamphlets on the, on the stand there. And I was just looking at these thinking, well, I don't want to be an engineer now. What am I going to do? And there was a, a little pamphlet that was jammed in underneath the, um, the stand that was holding the pamphlets and pamphlet, the pamphlets. And I pulled it out and there's a picture of a guy in a uniform um, with uh, epaulets, gold braid on his sleeves, and he's pounding a Morse key. Now, back in the day when you got an amateur radio license, you had to be proficient in Morse code. The novice license was five words per minute. The amateur operator's full certificate was 10 words per minute. Now, if you wanted to go away to see as a radio officer, believe it or not, even back in the 80s when I was at the Australian Maritime College, you had to be proficient at Morse to 20 words per minute. So double what you needed for the amateur radio license. But I did have a distinct advantage. So anyway, I'm looking at this guy in a radio officer's uniform and I'm thinking, yeah, two years and I can be doing that. Anyway, cut a long story short, did a year at the Maritime College and we were told radio officers were very rapidly being made redundant by satellite technology, a thing called GMDSS. Now, GMDSS stands for the Global Maritime Distress Sea Safety System. And it was basically a conglomeration of a variety of um, technologies that made um, radio officers redundant, automation, brought about by things like GPS positioning systems, um, global um, uh, geostationary satellites. Uh, Inmarsat was one of them, Inmarsat A, B and C, which provided basically a means of getting weather and nav warnings to a ship, ships in a given geographical location automatically. So a printer on the bridge, also things like digital selective calling for HF, all this sort of stuff. Anyway, for you technical geeks out there, that's what was um, replacing me on board ships. I've, um, I've done away with the, uh, the lockdown look. I've managed to have a haircut and shave. So trying to be a little bit more presentable. So I went away to the Maritime College 
when I had to do my Morse code uh, ex examination, I did it a year early, uh, or six months early. After my first year, uh, our examiners came up to us, our lecturers came up to us at the Australian Maritime College and said, look, radio offices are being made redundant. You're no longer going to have a job. Most of the guys decided, okay, I'm going to do the associate diploma in maritime electronics, or marine electronics, or whatever it was called, ADME. There was a group of us that the guy that was running the radio communications, the associate diploma of marine radio communications, a group of us were told by this guy, hey guys, if you graduate with the ADMR and you can't get a job as a ship's radio officer, you still have the same piece of paper essentially. Uh, you'll still be able to get a technician exempt status for a broadcast operator certificate, which is what you needed to be a technician in a radio station. So you might as well just finish the, the radio course and you never know, while people are tying up loose ends and integrating this new technology, you might actually get some work. So a number of us stuck with it. We were pretty much derided by some of the other people were saying, you know, you, you're really wasting your time. You're not going to get jobs. You, you're not going to get as good a qualification, etc., etc. But for the people that stuck to their guns, like, I mean, one of the gentlemen that I was at Maritime College with, ended up being on the supply vessel, the Antarctic supply vessel as a radio officer on that ship. And he now has a PhD and works in Lucerne as, um, in computing. So in his time off between trips to Antarctica, because the ship only operated during parts of the season, he got himself another degree. And the rest of us, and prior to that, all of us were working, as it turns out, a little bit on ships, uh, as, ship, as the radio officers aged and started falling over, either because they were too drunk or because they were just really old and frail, there was no one to replace them. And they needed them on the ships, but there was no one to put on the ships. So the ship can't sail without the radio officer, they lose their insurance. So they're in a, between a rock and a hard place. So there was a period of time there when I was told you'll never get a job on a proper ship. And I actually did. So I'll tell you that story in a moment. But most of us, um, straight after graduating, got work in the offshore industry on um, what they call mobile offshore drilling units. And, they're, and there's, those vessels basically drill for oil, exploratory vessels looking for oil. And some of us were on dynamically positioned versions of those ships, so they're like an oil rig that can't anchor because the water's too deep. So they have a positioning system to hold them in location. I worked on one of those vessels at one point in time. We worked on floating production, storage and offload vessels like the Jabiru Venture which were basically uh, a floating, an old oil tanker that was floating in the middle of the ocean that was taking oil from the seabed, doing a bit of processing to it and then offloading onto other vessels. So I worked on those for a little while. And I also worked on dive support vessels uh, with saturation divers working on subsea completions at the bottom of the ocean, preparing wellheads and whatnot. So lots of very varied work. And let me say that after a two year qualification, it paid really really well to give you an idea uh, i graduated in 88 the end of 88 so in 1989 my first job was as a, a technical assistant it wasn't offshore technical assistant to the uh, test engineer at a company called SciTech, which was data communications and i was making 19 and a half thousand dollars now my first job that i got offshore was about 60 to 65 thousand so more than uh three times what I was earning. And it was more than what the test engineer at SciTech was making at the time, a fully qualified and experienced engineer. So I was making loads of money and you worked a month on and then you got a month off. And sometimes in my month off, I was getting some work as well. So, and you think about the fact that when you're working offshore for those six months, you don't spend the money. Your food and board is taken care of. So, uh, I put away a lot of money. Uh, it was a it was a great uh, career choice for me, and I did it for about six or seven years. So if you want to see the vessels that I've worked on, by the way, uh, there's a, a video, and I'll put the link downstairs in the description of all the ships that I worked on from beginning to end, with a little bit of a, a, an insight into what the job entailed as well. So you'll have a picture of each vessel that I worked on, you know, pretty much in chronological order. Uh, but that video has done quite well too, amazingly, even though it's quite a niche area for, for interest. But I really worry about people forgetting about this job because it was a really important job. They started carrying radio officers on ships 
when the Titanic sunk, basically, it was became a mandatory requirement. They did have some radio officers on, on the um on the Titanic, but one of the reasons why it was so tragic was because they were trying to call a nearby ship, but the radio officer wasn't on watch. So uh, after that, they needed a twenty four hour watch. Now later on, on the ships that I was on, they had a thing called a, a, a watch keeping receiver, which was a form of automation. So if you were sinking, you'd actually send, um, uh, I think it was twelve four second dashes, and if the receiver received at least three of those in a row. Uh, it, the bells would go off in the radio officer's cabin and he'd get up and he'd come and, and he'd come and help. So if you were after hours and you thought well, there's not going to be a radio officer on watch, you'd normally start your distress transmission with those uh, tones to see if uh, you could wake one of the radio officers up. So great job. Um, and basically I was living the dream. Uh, had a, a fantastic time offshore. But I kept saying... Essentially, when I was working on the oil rigs, they had proper radio rooms, some of these places. Even some of them had wireless telegraphy gear, but they never used it. It was sort of sitting there. It had to be maintained to keep the license going, but you weren't keeping proper watch. You weren't taking weather and navigation warnings. You weren't doing any of the things you were trained to do. And that was kind of sad for me, and I was thinking, will I ever get the chance? And I'd ring up occasionally and say, look, mate, don't even dream about it. You're never going to get work on a ship. Technically, I wasn't even properly qualified because normally if you're going to work on a merchant ship, once you had your radio certificate, you would then have to do an apprenticeship uh, for a few months and hand over so that you actually knew um, how to do the job properly. Well, anyway, round about, I think it was around about Christmas time, uh, I was between contracts on the rigs, so I was probably helping out uh, um, my good friend John, who had a handyman's business, and the phone rang. And it was CSR, company CSR, that had ships. Sadly, I don't I think they might have one ship left maybe on the coast, but they had three ships at the time. And their radio officer was in Port Pirie, and he had tripped and broken his ankle. And the ship couldn't sail. So they basically said, can you get on a plane this afternoon? And I said, yeah, well, I'm there. So he flew me down, got me out to Port Pirie. I'm basically... Um, getting on the ship and they're pulling up the gangway and the ship's sailing and um the gentleman that's there saying what's your morse code like and i look at him and i start laughing and i say yeah it's funny and he goes no no really this is a wt ship wireless telegraphy ship what's your morse like and i'm like oh so i say yeah it's okay I'm, i'll i'll be all right I, I'm, I know what i'm doing so anyway uh First watch that I did, I took the weather and I was thinking to myself, when I got the radio room, I was just looking around and going, I knew some, I knew most of the gear. Uh, most of the gear was actually the gear that was being trained, I was trained on at the Maritime College. So they'd done a good job of that. Most of the Australian ships were pretty much, much of a muchness um, equipment wise. So had Apollo receivers and Conqueror HS transmitters and all that sort of stuff. So it all was reasonably familiar, but I'm still looking and going, been years since I'd touched any of this gear, two or three years. Hadn't done Morse for three years. Never had done it outside a lab apart from amateur operating for, you know, on, on odd occasions. So basically I was terrified. Anyway, I took the first weather broadcast that I had to take and I had lots of asterisks in there, which is basically saying I didn't get that character. Brought it up to the bridge and handed it to the officer on watch and he just looked at me and went, what is this? No, it's the weather. And he goes, I can't read this. And I said, look, there's a lot of static tonight. It was a really bad night. And he got this very worried look on his face. Anyway, the next morning, the captain turns up and he walks into the radio office. And his name was, I think his name was Patrick Liu. And he's a Singaporean. And he's basically said, hey, how's it going? And I said, oh, it's going okay. I'm like... Show, showing as much hubris as I can. And I'm saying, yeah, it's fine. It's all good. And he goes, well, I need to do a, a radio telephone call. So can you get me, get me? Um, I think it was Adelaide Radio. Can you get me Adelaide Radio? I want to I wanna, I wanna do a, a radio telephone call. So I'm like, yeah, no worries. Look over at the transmitter and it's tuned to the, the radio telephone frequency. It used to be called, I think, Channel 811. 
So basically radio telephone is you have two frequencies, one to transmit, one to receive, and it's like making a telephone call. And you can actually link to a telephone line via the coast station, okay, all the old stuff. So I'm thinking, okay, if I touch that transmitter to go to the calling frequency, then I have to retune it. Now I wasn't even, I wasn't even sure at that time whether I was confident in doing that, especially with the captain looking over my shoulder. So I thought, that's tuned up, antennas are selected, it's ready to go. But if I call the coast station on that frequency, they're not gonna hear me, because they're listening on the calling frequency. So I'd have to go back and change frequency. So I thought, well, what can I do here? So I turned around and they had a, a reserve transmitter, which basically had three buttons on it, and was tuned to the, um, the calling frequency for the station, which is at 500 kilohertz, for those nerds out there that wanna know. And I thought, I'm supposed to test that every day. So I looked at the captain and I said, oh, Captain Skipper, I'm supposed to test this. I'm just gonna call the coast station here. So I got on and in Morse code, using Q codes, um, requesting a, 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 a red phone channel. Q codes are like three uh, letter codes that tell the coast station what you want to do. And basically it's a way for um, ships of any nationality to ask questions, okay? So I'm, I've basically gone, um, this is uh, VMQK, I think it was the call sign of my ship. Uh, VIA was the, freak, uh, was the call sign for the coast station. QRJ, radio telephone call, 811, etc., etc. And I'm thinking, oh, there's no way this is going to work. And I hear back, did it, which is basically the coast station saying, cool, see you there. And I'm like, I look at the, I look at the captain, I go, no worries, pick up the mic and, um, you know, uh, Adelaide Radio, Adelaide Radio, this is Ormiston, Ormiston, Victor Mike, Quebec Kilo, and the answer. And I request the um, number that the captain needs. I think he was um, wanting to speak to the company. And I and I think it might, might have been about me. Who knows? But anyway, no, um, hand the mic over to the captain and he does his call and he goes, thanks, um, Sparks, no worries. And he, off he goes. So <laughs> I'm thinking to myself, Mate, he saw me use the Morse key. <laughs> we used both transmitters. I, I'm, I'm okay, but that night, I'm thinking, I've still got to, I've still got to nail this weather and navigation warning thing or I'm going to be in trouble. So I'm looking around for a tape recorder. This was in the days before we had our little smartphones that we could have, I could have probably just rung the bloody Bureau of Met if I had the smartphone, but looking for a, a tape recorder. Do you think there was a tape recorder in the radio offices? No, of course not. So... That night, I just put my little Bakelite headphones on and started praying. And people talk about the power of the situation to empower you, to get you to actually do the right thing. And that night, I took weather and I took nav warnings like, like a boss and a couple of errors, but basically things that I could fill in, brought it up to the bridge and went, there you go. And... It was a good feeling, and the officer on watch looked and went, "Good on your sparks." Read it. We had a bit of a chat, had a cup of tea, you know, looking out at the ocean. And um, from then on, I was pretty much okay. Uh, I won't say I was one hundred percent confident about all the gear, but I could do the job, and I was doing the job. So I was on that vessel for two trips, six weeks each, plus the six weeks in between. And in the six weeks in between. Also did a short stint on their sister ship, the Kawaka. And so that were the times where I actually got to be a real radio officer. Now, I have found this uh, little memory box, which is in the Baby Wipes box. Now, it's quite um, uh, fitting that it's in the Baby Wipes box because the um, time I stopped being a radio officer was basically the birth of my son. And I decided I did one trip away and my wife had difficulties after the birth and you know it's pretty scary being left with a newborn baby and our phone bill was like nine hundred dollars because it was ten dollars us per minute to make a satellite call and she was ringing me with cracked nipples and um, difficulties feeding the baby and i came back and he was like he, i left when he was this big and you know a month later it was this big and i thought i don't want to miss this so job was starting to come to an end anyway so i i, I bailed out and became a technician Story for another time, perhaps, if this video goes okay and people are really interested. 
No doubt they most likely won't be. But anyway, in this memory box here, I've got some of the things that, um, you know, sort of like tell of my time at sea. Um, these are old um, videotapes of my son's birthday, so um, that's the reason why I stopped being at sea. And um, the reason why I went to sea, of course, was because I had an interest in radio. Now, that is not a real Morse code key. I know people are going to go, oh, as if that's a, it is a, it's a hobby key. It's the sort of thing that Dick Smith was selling. And um, I was teaching myself Morse code for my amateur licenses on this. I really wish I'd stolen one of the keys off one of the ships that was getting rid of its radio room because um, it'd be a nice thing to have. And I know I had a friend, I won't say who it was, but someone who took one of the keys when he left the ship when it was being, when the GMDSS gear that was replacing him was being put on, he said, I'm taking this bloody key and good on him because now he has one. But anyway, um, I'm going to show you, I've got some photos in here of my time at sea and a few other things that might be, or might not be of interest, but um, we shall see how many people actually watch this video. Um, so, let's have a look. Now the Ormiston was the ship that uh, that I was working on the first time and that is the radio room there um, and that's me at the quay. Uh, my parents actually visited one time while we were in port and if you know the Anzac Bridge in Sydney where the apartments are, that used to be the CSR wharves and we'd come in there and um, you know we'd take the lifeboat out to do a test, and six pack in there, cruise around Sydney Harbour and then the, the captain would quite often say, hey, Sparks, what are you doing here? Go home. And they might be um, alongside for three or four days sometimes. And I was being paid and getting a day's leave for each day we were uh, on board. And um, yeah, swimming at Bondo Beach. Or, so great job. Didn't pay as well as offshore. Probably like half as much. But, you know, they had a bar on board. And it wasn't dry like the oil rigs. And it was a lot of fun. Um, but you can see here, there's there's various bits of equipment. That, that um, thing there just there is... Um, uh, the Apollo receiver and um, up here is the antenna selector and we've got reserve transmitters over here and reserve receivers and I think that was the auto keyer that uh, does the auto keying work and over here this little keyboard that was actually ARQ Telex which was a new thing that was coming in um, that allowed me to actually um, a lot of the transmissions that I was doing I mean I took weather and nav warnings um, via Morse but I didn't have to do a lot of transmitting the a lot of the information was being transmitted for like pilot boarding ground when we were arriving at a port, all that sort of stuff was happening via HF Telex, which happened on this device here, which I was I actually understood how to use because we were using that for drilling reports and whatnot um, back in the 80s and the 90s on some of the rigs I was on. So that's me at the key, um, and you can see up here the clock. Now, if you see these clocks on ships, they usually have a red um, a little zone three minutes um, after the hour and the half hour or the quarter to or quarter past, and there it's actually called silence periods. And that was a time where you, no one was allowed to transmit on the calling frequencies, and you just had to listen to see if anyone was in distress. So it was a way of like making sure the frequencies were silent for those periods. So, um, you know, the good old days. That is me on the Ormerson um, in a typical Australian radio room. This was um, a well test on one of the rigs that I worked on. I think it was um, the Ocean Bounty from memory. Um, so mobile offshore drilling unit, we discovered some gas and that was the only time I actually was on a rig where they did a, a well test. So um, we did a lot of drilling, didn't find a lot of oil. Um, this is um, a cabin. This was actually a cabin on the, um, uh, I think it was on the Peregrine, um, uh, which was a, uh, I was doing dive support. That was a dive support with saturation divers. So I've got stories about that um, trip as well. So like I said, people interested, I shall definitely show. There's a whole heap of photos in here. Um, this is the, the actual heli deck on that dive support vessel, the Alliance. Worked on that during a Christmas trip. And what else we got here? That's another um, ocean bounty uh, photo of the well test. So what they do is they open the well up and light it. And then they um, flare it for a while, several hours to a day, 24 hours maybe, I can't remember. And then they shut it down and then they see how much pressure builds up. And that's a way of determining um, how much um, oil and gas is down there. And it's, um, it's a fascinating field, petrochemical engineering. and. You know, something that maybe I should have looked into, but I think, once again, it's one of those dying um, industries. But having said that, 
Um, I've already benefited from one dying industry when I became a radio officer, so perhaps um, I should look into it. Um, anyway, that is a dive, uh, not a dive support vessel, that's a support vessel. Every time you're on an oil rig, there'll be one of these workboats, they call them the workboats. They bring stuff to and from the rigs as well, and there's always one on standby in case something happens. And they're just waiting there basically to you know pick people out of the ocean if we have a Piper Alpha happen on us. Um, which thankfully didn't happen. Another um, ocean bounty well test. And that is how we used to get to and from. And I would have to do uh, training every two years. They called it Hewitt training, helicopter underwater escape training. And one day I shall um, talk about that as well, um, but not in this uh, video, because it's already, God, I've been babbling on for 20 minutes. So I'm hoping that um, you're still watching. Uh, this is a picture from the bridge on, I think this was actually uh, the dive support vessel that I was on, the Alliance. Now this is um, the radio room and it's not typical Australian equipment because it's actually, I think it's a Norwegian rig and it's called the Bifid Dolphin. Now the Bifid Dolphin is an interesting rig and if you look up Bifid Dolphin Disaster, it's a really horrible one, so if you're squeamish or you don't like things, horrible things happening to people, don't go to it. But basically, they had some um, saturation divers on board, in a, um, under saturation, in a, a, a bell on board that they were living in for two weeks. Because they keep them at the same pressure that they would normally be diving at the whole time. And someone opened the wrong valve, so <clears throat> enough said about that, it was quite horrible. Um, and what else have we got here? Oh yes, and that's the reason why, well, apart from the end of the industry, the main reason why I stopped being a radio officer became what I am now, a clown. So, they're the photos. Another interesting thing in my, in my box is, um, my, my nappy sand box, is the, um, the certificates they used to give you, because I think, you know, once upon a time, People used to give certificates were quite interesting. Now, whenever you came on a ship, um, you would sign on a thing called articles. Um, I think this might be, let's have a look at what this is. Oh, this is a certificate for medical fitness when I um, got medivac off a rig. If you wanna hear that story, um, in the comment section below say, hey, more, sign, more old stories of being at sea, and I will definitely put them up, um, because yeah, I had an interesting story to tell there. Um, also, every two years, like I was saying, helicopter underwater escape training, that is the, um, that is the, uh, the certificate that you would get every two years. Um, so I can tell you some stories about that as well. Um, so yeah, lots of stories I could tell, like um, aside from the paranormal stories that I've been telling of late. So, when I went to the Maritime College, the first certificate that I got was this thing here. It looks really fancy, doesn't it? Restricted Operators um, Certificate of Proficiency. Now, this is the sort of thing that you would get um, if you were going to be uh, operating equipment on a, um, on like a fishing ship, and it's, it's specific transmitters and receivers, so you're actually qualified to use certain types of gear. And we did that um, so that when we went on our trip on the college, the Australian Maritime College training vessel, we would be able to use the gear on board that thing. Um, and then of course, after two years, um, we got uh, this wonderful certificate, which is called an ROGCP. And this is the, the real deal. And it basically um, tells you what I am qualified to do, okay? And things like um, a knowledge of general pr um, principles of electricity and the theory of radio, so far as relevant to the requirements of paragraphs B and C, theoretical knowledge of marine radio telegraph and telephony, te telephony transmitters. I won't read the whole thing. Um, proficiency at Morse code, 20 words per minute, um, knowledge of ITU regulations, all that sort of stuff. So it was, it was quite in depth. Like you had to know a, a, a ton of stuff to, to do the job. And something really um, to be very, very proud of, I think anyway, once upon a time, what a great job. Um, and then for a part of the time when I was at sea, oh yeah, prior to going, leaving the Maritime College, we got this. And we had to, you know, we had to go in a life raft 
in the uh, college pool and they had thunder and lightning and they sprayed a fire hose on us to try and make it as realistic as possible. Turned the lights off and had flashes, strobe lights for thunder and lightning and made it as you know realistic as possible. We didn't have like 50 metre swell and stuff like that, which, you know, so we were all laughing our heads off for the entire time we were doing it. But um, that's our certificate of um, safety of life at sea certificate that you would do as well. So um, like, luckily I never had to, uh, to use any of that information or that, that, that training because going for a swim in the middle of Bass Strait or something, I, I don't think would be a lot of fun. Um, and one of the ships I was on, or sorry, one of the oil rigs I was on, which was one of the mobile um, offshore drilling units. Now they, they had to carry marine crew because they um, were self-propelled somewhat and the unions were quite strong at the time and they made sure that they carried a marine crew, including the radio officer. So although they had the radio telephony equipment on board, we never used it. We were basically um, clerks doing admin drilling reports, pe people on board reports, um, communicating to and from the rig with helicopters, all that sort of stuff. But one of these rigs was a Panamanian flagged vessel and I had to have a Panamanian radio license. So this is one of the things I'm most proud of. This is a Panamanian <laughs> radio certificate, which I just had to fill out some paperwork for. Um, and it's, you know, it looks really fancy. It's got all the photos in it. And I also got um, the actual certificate as well that I can hang on my wall. And this is the Panamanian certificate as well certifying me as a ship's radio officer for a Panamanian vessel. Um, so that was great. Um, w when the um, GMDSS gear started coming out and there was the possible chance of me working on, still working offshore, I went and did a, uh, a GMDSS operator's qualification. Now, my radio certificate meant that I was qualified for life. This thing actually has a use-by date on it and um, so it's no longer valid, but, um, basically didn't really get to use it. Uh, so, but I did it in case. And while I was, um, deciding, you know, uh, what I'm going to do, I had this strange period of time where I thought I might want to be a pilot or a flight instructor. So there is the, uh, uh, flight license. Uh, it's a restricted, um, license private pilot's license so uh you know i'm not about to go and get a job with um Qantas or anyone like that but i did fly solo and i decided that i liked it but i like living more <laughs> so i had some new misses so um i wasn't really well suited to a career as a pilot so that's my little memory box uh, it's gone for nearly half an hour which is you know, a really long video. I'm hoping you've stuck with me till the end. And like I said, if you've enjoyed this video, write a comment below, ask me uh, about my time at sea. Also, if you would like videos that detail some of the things that happened to me while I was offshore, some more stories of my life at sea, I would be most happy to make more videos. But if they're not getting views and no one's interested and I'm just a boring old fart, talking about crap that no one wants to hear. Um, I'll leave it at that. But um, I, I, I've had some interesting times at sea and I hope you've enjoyed this video and a little bit of a nostalgic trip um, and a view or a look into life at sea not so long ago. Um, keeping in mind that Morse code didn't stop till the year 2000, which for some of you is probably before you're born if you're watching this in your um, you know, not older than 20 years old, but it, um, it wasn't that long ago and it was a, it was a, a, a really, uh, fantastic job to do. You're the only person on board that ship that could do that job. So it was something really to be proud of. So if there's any other, um, radio officers, ships, radio officers, um, listening to or watching this video, could you QSL in the comments below? You'll know what I mean. And, um, and let me know your um, story as well, because I think um, a little bit of a history of um, this particular job um, deserves to be put in cyberspace for uh, all eternity so people know about it. Anyway, thanks for watching, if you did watch, and uh, remember to like and subscribe. This is um, 
I'm, I'm going to QRT now, uh, Art of Engineering, over and out.